What is the most bull profession that actually exists? Paparazzi, professional stalking harassment. Look up Toby Maguire's breakdown in front of the press. He's yelling at them to move because he just wants to drive off, but they swarm and surround the car instead. Complete and utter bull that paparazzi can basically harass celebrities and get paid for it. Professional stalking, harassment, yes, but also some of it is carefully coordinated publicity. The Kardashians and others leak information, get the press there, and then bask in the publicity. Paparazzi who play nice and follow certain rules are more likely to get leaks. In the eyes of the viewer, it doesn't come across as shameless self-promotion, and celebrities get the aura of importance and prestige they need to maintain their image. Of course, it's not all staged. New York City Apartment Brokers I hate having a middleman. The only way it would make sense to me is if they were there to negotiate on my behalf, but instead they are incentivized to do the very opposite. I once heard about an apartment opening in New York City from a friend of mine in the building so I called the landlord and she said this is when it's available, this is the rent, oh and there's a broker's fee, and I'm the broker, such a scam but I paid it because you have to in New York. I understand this, and was deeply frustrated in the whole process of finding an apartment in New York City after living in multiple states where the process was mail in my out-of-state personal check, then show up and collect the keys, especially because no one I knew Ireland would help me. But my broker helped me, and was literally the only person who walked me through the process. I felt she earned her fee as I was walking though the rest of the process blindfolded. Maybe this is specifically a New York City issue, being a transplant. I wouldn't know. They're a natural consequence of rent stabilization, although at this point they're possibly just more of a holdover from when rent control was much stronger. But if you're going to artificially keep rent costs much lower than market value and make it very difficult to evict, then landlords are very incentivized to find a way to rent only to people who are financially stable or who can fall back on families who are financially stable. And this is how the apartment broker industry develops, whose only service is to artificially create a large initial down payment that renters have to meet for an apartment. Why do you believe they should be incentivized to negotiate on your behalf when both the buyer and seller have the option to hire a broker for themselves? This is like expecting a prosecutor to defend the accused and wondering why they are incentivized to do the very opposite. That is the entire essence of their job. Your defense attorney is your advocate, but you are choosing to represent yourself. I just don't understand why choosing self-representation means the other side has to bend to your wishes. They are the ones playing against you. Why would they help the opposite team they play against? Same goes with the broker the landlord hired. Why would you expect them to be in your corner? You didn't hire them. They don't owe people who didn't hire them a fiduciary level of responsibility. That's nuts. Imagine hiring a private investigator to catch your wife cheating, but instead they just hide your wife cheating because they think you're a bad husband. I think the assumption is that people with fiduciary levels of responsibility means they're going to do the right, ethical, moral, and fair thing to do for all parties and that is simply just not true and moronic to believe. Brokers only have a fiduciary level of responsibility to the person who hired them. It's perfectly fine and legal for a broker to say, hey, we can't have racial discrimination associated with our brokerage because it's illegal, but we can help you get the most profit from this doing X, Y, and Z. You're expecting the broker to just say, hey man, you are a racist and that's not cool, so we have to dissolve our working relationship. I don't give a damn if you are a racist. If you are paying me money, you could be the Grand Wizard of the KKK and I will continue giving you fiduciary level of service by breaking my back to get you the best deal. That's what the law mandates me to do. They don't mandate me to be the morality police. If the agent has the listing, they're representing the, the landlord. They legally can't you over and have to disclose things, but they're working for the landlord. You can get your own agent to show you around, which will be working for you. They're supposed to split the commission with the agent who has the listing. Most listing agents in the city are collecting 15% commission. They will split that no problem. The problem comes from the listing agents who are only collecting one month commission. They won't even entertain your personal agent cause they don't want to split the one month commission. Or they'll say now it's 15%. It also benefits the landlord cause you literally have someone who's essentially working on your behalf for free and will be happy to do it. Getting a listing in the city is free money for the agent, but is the hardest thing to do. 
Also, if the landlord has multiple properties, it just doesn't make sense not to hire an agent. I know a guy who owns 10-ish townhouses in Brooklyn in the Park Slope. Gowanus neighborhoods plus more all around the city, if he was to list every unit himself when it becomes vacant, he would be working full-time as a real estate agent. Better to just hire someone. It's very dumb. It does kind of fill a niche. I know someone who does this. He makes a very good living at it probably to 5 ok year. He mostly speaks at industry and professional associations conventions or large company retreats. I think these companies pack their schedule with all kind of technical stuff related to their actual work and then the organizers look at their agenda and think we should have one thing that's kind of different brings everyone together and sort of uplifts them. It's sort of like how every university graduation has some famous person speak at it. Anyway, I've heard his routine and I don't think the words themselves provide really anything of value to anyone, it's all a lot of enthusiastic truisms. But he does serve the demand for let's have one person to a big, loud and fun speech that's different from the rest of the weekend where we all talk about the best way to sell metal brackets or whatever. Anyone who says they have an investing strategy 100% makes money from selling this bull and couldn't make money investing in a million years. I have an investment strategy, but I'm not trying to sell it. Free advice. Max out your 401,000 on whatever match you get. Go with mutual funds or whatever. Doesn't matter if you won't be at that job until you retire. Take advantage of the free money. Even if you pull it all out early, the big penalty that seems to worry people is that you pay like 10% plus the taxes you would pay on it anyway. It looks like a lot because of the taxes, but really it's just 10% over what you would have paid anyway. Your match should more than cover it, unless it s. Even if you don't keep it going forever, switching jobs is a convenient time to get a call from. The 401,000 company asking if you want to stay with them now that your employer isn't covering the FEs or if you just want a check for $20,000. What makes it 1000x more hilarious is when it's almost entirely finance people falling for that bull. The number of times I've walked into a financial planner's office that has had a Ing Dave Ramsey book on their shelf has been too many goddamn times for me to count. There is no easier group of people on this earth to grift than fintech people. They are all scared and desperate because they chose careers in a system that's mostly administrated by algorithms and machine learning and impenetrable to humans, so they'll clutch onto whatever voodoo magic. Buy this book and gain financial success that crosses their paths and promises to make the big scary financial system make sense. And yes, I'm including humanity's most gullible people like Trump supporters in that estimation. Because at least Trump supporters can see that Trump exists in some capacity. Fintech people see literally nothing, just numbers on a screen, and go, that's how I'm going to make it, joining this illusory system with nothing backing it and the rules completely skewed to keep feeding money into the pockets of the same 200 people at the top. I used work for an insurance firm. I sat in weekly meetings where we would review claims that were appealed for coverage after the first denial. There was one case where someone racked up $7,000 for breast reduction surgery. She complained of severe back pain, and her doctor said the surgery was medically necessary row deal with the pain however, the board determined the surgery was cosmetic more than medically necessary and was denied a second time. Needless to say I left the company and the industry shortly after. It's so messed up how many medical issues people face and how much they pay for medical services. Then there's people like my old boss who would make a motion to deny coverage, sometimes on a whim. I worked at an American regional health insurance company, here after Hick a while back, doing software stuff, not insurance stuff. I learned that Hick, which I have no reason to believe is fundamentally any different from any other insurance company has an equal number of employees processing first submission claims as they do employees processing appeals. It seemed like the rule of thumb was, when in doubt, deny the claim, and maybe the customer won't appeal. The one story I heard that still makes my blood boil was about a woman who had diabetes and had a leg amputated below the knee. Hick covered her prosthesis. At her doctor's strong recommendation, she lost a lot of weight to help manage her diabetes. Now the prosthesis didn't fit well it rubbed and chafed at the part of her leg where it fit onto, even when she tried to pat it. She asked Hick to cover another prosthesis because, after all, she'd followed her doctor's recommendation to lose the weight. Hick denied the claim, one prosthesis per surgery. She couldn't afford another prosthesis on her own. 
Her leg got infected from the constant rubbing of the ill-fitting prosthesis, and she had to have her leg amputated again, above the knee this time. Hick covered her new post-op prosthesis. I used to do medical case management and dealt with this all the time, mostly for medication. HIV specialist wanted to switch patient to new HIV drug. Insurance company says no, this happens way more than most people realize. I start the appeal process. The doctor tells the insurance company that this new drug is much better for the patient because it's less likely to cause long-term liver damage and the patient has clear clinical indicators of early liver problems. Insurance company says no. Doctor again emphasizes that this is a medically necessary switch. Insurance company says no, they will not pay for that drug, but patient is welcome to pay the 2k month out of pocket for it. Or the patient who wanted to try more physical therapy, safe and cheap before back surgery, risky and expensive, but their insurance wouldn't cover any more PD. I worked in a cardiology office and if we didn't have the prior authorization paperwork filled out to perfection and they had like 29 specific questions, they would deny a procedure, surgery. We would include the hospital records or the office visit note, but nope didn't answer question 24 exactly how they wanted to qualify this surgery. It's okay, the literal doctor says it's necessary and urgent and the patient might die if this isn't done today, but someone on the other end of a fax didn't like the paperwork we sent. It was incredibly nerve-wracking for myself as a medical assistant to try to figure out when my doctor was unreachable. I ing hate Humana specifically. Unless you buy private insurance, it's your company making that decision. I have a super fun story about Charter Communications choosing to revoke their coverage of formula for the medically fragile unless it goes straight into a feeding tube. Our baby's formula costs something like 60 can and she had to use it until she was 3. You can't purchase it in a store and if you don't have insurance the distributor charges insurance price like 8100. We had to buy the on Amazon and beg doctors and hospitals for the free samples they got. Luckily, it's so rare to need it that we got samples often enough to cover about a third or a half of what we needed. We tried to fight insurance. It took months. We had the state we were living in's regulation board helping us. Turns out Charter has strategically moved the part of the company in charge of that to a state with little to no regulation. You can only complain by filling out a form or visiting them office in person. Our home state advised us to give up as this was a new tactic they haven't been able to fight. I actually have knowledge here, so each new procedure that gets approved needs to show how it improves on previous approaches. If we can cure a bacterial infection with penicillin we don't need a better mousetrap that costs a lot more for very little return. When there are serious illness we look at Qualey's quality adjusted life years. What good life is this procedure providing? They'll talk to Congress and the Blues, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. If they prove the increase in price justifies adding it they will. Most insurance just follows their rates. No one agent is identifying treatments for yes or no. Ticket broker and console broker. Aka ticket scalper and console scalper. Add no value to the transaction. Just needlessly insert themselves to profit. M. This needs to be illegalized or punished in some way. It's getting ridiculous. Because you have enough money to buy out the majority of a show or product initially, do it, then sell it for multiple times the amount of money and it's legal because you bought it. The government already has regulations on scalping in times of crisis. Might as well stick those same regulations on scalping in times of I bought 400 seats at $50 and sold them for $150 each. Or even better, have them face the same punishments some lesser criminals have been facing. I like what the states have been doing recently. Instead of jailing them, where taxpayer dollars pay for their food and house, just federally garnish their wages. Almost anything they make legally goes poof in the wind until their literal debt to society is paid off. Anyone who sells Melem garbage. No, I don't want to buy your average at best makeup. I've spent 20 years trying to get my mom to understand that people are not interested in Herbalife, and that's why people stopped answering her phone calls. I created a website for her sewing business. She was retired now good. She could duplicate a dress from a picture, think prom and whatever in celerity at the time. She created cosplay costumes, cloth only, none of the foam or plastic shapes. She was obsessed with also including her melem crap on the website, and just to stop hearing about it, I did it. It slowly turned into more and more of a melem website. A couple years into that I stopped paying the domain name. 
My mom just gave this spiel rant in a restaurant about how this girl who's dying of cancer would be magically cured if she drank azea, the water that's only other ingredient is salt from last time I checked. So yeah, I guess salt water creates stem cells which heals cancer according to my mom. And she had the audacity to call the girl with cancer stupid because she was gonna give her the salt water for free. My mom even said, doctors don't know everything. Like yeah that's true, but if Azia was truly the cure to cancer don't ya yeah think everyone in the world would be drinking it? And doctors would be using it in treatments by now? I actually wanted to smack my mom in the head and say, why are you so f***ing gullible to fall for bull melms every time and then complain when you go broke because no one buys your stuff? When I was younger, and a little more naive, some dude at the grocery store overheard me talking about a presentation I had to give for my work. We chatted for a bit and exchanged information for what in my mind was networking purposes. He contacted me a few weeks later to meet about a business opportunity, partnership, and I said sure cause I was interested and wanted to hear him out. They asked me some questions and I tried to ask them questions, and they seemed really nice. And like they were genuinely interested in some big venture, but what should have been a red flag right away was the fact that they never told me what the they actually wanted to sell or produce. They just said a lot of business bingo words and talked about their time getting to know people and live their lives with total freedom, but never once did they give me specific information that I asked about. After a month of this, I'm ashamed to say it took me that long to figure it out, I just declined working with them. To this day, I still have no idea what they did but it was either an MLM or some sort of organized crime, though I don't think there's much of a difference. A friend of mine told me about a class in the area and framed it as a class on various animals' body language and behavior. I showed up and nope, pure psychic bull. I know a lot about birds especially and it was just all sheer nonsense. One thing that stuck out was the teacher saying she a student's cockatiela saying she wishes you wouldn't eat eggs around her since she identifies with the shared bird energy of the egg and it makes her feel less safe as if a large portion of eggs weren't ya know made specifically for baby birds to eat, and eating of unfertilized eggs isn't a common natural behavior. And even if it wasn't, still dumb as hell. Absolute clowns at best, more often idiots preying on grieving and desperate people. I think most of them genuinely took themselves seriously, and actually believed all the bull wholeheartedly. A little whimsy is important, believe in your lucky underwear, make wishes on dandelion puffs. Charging someone $100 to tell them their dog wants them to continue putting them through painful medical treatment with only a small chance of success? S. Psychic, any kind, especially those who prey on people mourning the dead and convincing them they are speaking. My sister saw a psychic after she lost her son in an untimely accident. I believe it to be bull myself and she typically would also believe it to be bull but grief is hard. This woman has helped my sister navigate her grief for sure. I see no difference in psychics or religion in this sense. How do you tell a grieving mother this small bit of positivity you're experiencing in the hardest part of your life is bull? Easy answer. You don't you give that person a hug and tell them you love them. Tell evangelists, I am a Christian and I agree with you. It is almost always a complete scam for money. Using the word and the name of God to convince people to spend money or to give people false hope and promises of worldly concessions. Money, success in career, status, health. These preachers tell people what they want to hear and in exchange become very popular. It is sad because I think a lot of people denounce Christianity because they see obvious ploys like this. I hope anyone reading this knows that the central ideas of Christianity do not support rhetoric you see on these shows. Christianity has nothing to do with donations or earning favor with God through doing good deeds or God promoting you at work because you asked the 700 club to pray for you. I can't stand these people. My grandmother watches them because she's very religious and not much else on TV she enjoys. She's in her 90s so she watches a lot of TV. She called their number to make a donation, and once they got her on the phone, they kept hounding her for donations. 
which she felt obligated to do. They were taking advantage of the fact she was old, they very nearly had her convinced to sell her house, move into an old folks home and donate all the money from her house to them because it's what God wanted. Luckily my grandma was sharp enough to talk to us about what was going on. It took me weeks to get them to stop calling her and I low-key had to threaten them with physical harm and arson. Had to help a friend of mine look for his newer jeep after it was towed. He drank too much the night before, and the farmer's market was to be set up where he parked. My city has contracts with tow companies to move them a few blocks away. We looked for hours and couldn't find it anywhere. Called every tow company in town. Nothing. We assumed it was stolen at that point, so called the police and told them the situation. On a whim, I talked him into going to all the tow yards and hitting his alarm button. Lo and behold, the most predatory tow company by reputation had it. They said he had to pay $250 to get it out. Also, they were going to charge him 85 bucks as a lot fee overnight, even when they had no reason to the it to their lot. We ended up having to call someone with the keys at 10 o'clock at night, after looking for nearly 6 hours, when we threatened to get the police involved. My friend is particularly well off and didn't want to deal with the hassle and red tape, so he paid the 250 If it was my car, I would have raised some hell. If that place burned to the ground, I wouldn't piss on the ashes was gonna post this in reply to someone else but realized I was going a bit far with it, so here it is as a top-level reply, reminds me of something similar that happened to us. Neighbor kept parking in the spot that we had assigned to us, and would constantly double park on us and block us in. Nothing ever happened. Finally came home at midnight one night and go figure, neighbor was parked in our spot and there was no parking left in the entire apartment complex or for a few blocks. So I did what they always do, but I left them enough room to get out in the morning. Next morning rolls around and my car's gone. Found out the hoa had my car towed. Why? Not because I double parked, but because we didn't have parking permits. That literally no one else in the complex had. That was, that was their reasoning. Neighbor had family on the HOA board, and the tow company was operated by someone related to another one of the HOA board members. From what I was told by my roommate, who had been there three years. Prior to me the HOA for some reason hated the landlord who owned the unit we were in and took it out on the occupants she rented to, in an effort to intimidate her into selling or something. I dunno. We left not long after this happened. A few years ago I went to visit a friend of mine in the next state over. I was going to spend the night there so I needed to park my car at his apartment complex. They didn't have assigned spaces or anything, you just were given a tag that you had to hang from your rear view mirror. And residents were given one for visitors to use. My friend told me all about how it was total bull how the tow truck driver operated. If you didn't have the tag hanging in your car by 8pm you were getting towed, and the driver would come to the complex at 7 and drift around through the parking lot like a shark hunting for prey, just trying to find that one car without a tag that he could immediately tow the second the clock strikes eight. He'd seen several people have their cars towed for forgetting to hang their tag up. Well despite telling me all this, he forgot to give me the tag until he looked at the clock and realized it was 7.59. We ran outside and by the time we got to my car the tow truck was already hauling it away. Had to go to the impound lot the next day and pay 300 bucks to get my car back. My friend promised me he'd pay me back since it was totally his fault for forgetting to give me the tag even though he was fully aware of the consequences. But he had a kid to take care of and I didn't, so I just ate the loss and never demanded the money from him.